we are waiting for more participants to join. Please remain with us. Okay, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to uh, a new webinar of the European Association of Neurosurgical Society, Emerging Technologies and Innovation Task Force. This is our webinar number three, and it will be all about controversies of innovation in artificial intelligence and in uh, neurosurgery. We are thrilled to have two uh, fantastic speaker, Professor James Giordano will be joining us from the United States. Uh, Mario Ganao will be joining us from, um, Oxford. from the UK. Oxford. Thank you, Mario. So, and, and we also uh, can count of, uh, in our panel, first of all, uh, Nikolai Gabrowski uh, from Sofia, and uh, uh, Marcel Ivanov, and also Florian Ringel from uh, Germany, and uh, Enrico Tessitori uh, from Switzerland. The European Association of Neurosurgical Society Emerging Technologies and Innovation Task Force was uh, created recently after the initiative of uh, Professor Gabrowski and intends to bring the, to the attention of the neurosurgical community a uh, relevant discussion about the present and future technology. Especially, we want to bring together the perspective to, uh, from other disciplines. Uh, let's say ideas coming from outside uh, neurosurgery, because innovations um, uh, from other fields can easily disrupt our field and conversely, because we think that we are the one working every day and touching the most important complex and, and beautiful organ in, in nature, in the universe. So our innovation in our field might also uh, affect other human endeavors. So our mission is to create uh, this space for interactions between researchers, engineers, entrepreneurs, computer scientists, neuroscientists, regulators, and others too. And the aim is not just to discuss, but it's an active role to promote uh, innovation itself and also the implementation of new technique, because we believe that progress in neurosurgery is something that we want and something possible. So the title of today's webinar is Controversies of Innovation in Artificial Intelligence and Neurosurgery. And, it's, uh, and we think about it uh, because every innovation, especially those who are significant, which are significant, never come without controversy. And those controversies present ethical challenge then need, needs to be addressed carefully. Um, I will allow myself to, to make a brief introduction because uh, we are all neurosurgeons, no particular specialist in, in uh, the field of artificial intelligence, but just very basic. One thing that I wanna point out is the difference. We have on the one side, natural intelligence and on the other side artificial intelligence natural intelligence is uh, means human-like intelligence including consciousness subjective experience and creativity and we don't understand fully this process 
uh, we have not yet answered the so-called, as in one of Professor Giordano papers, the hard question of how mind occur in brain. We don't know that. But in a sense, we assume that the mind is a software running in the brain that is a hardware. Then you have the artificial intelligence, which is the soft AI, as Professor Giordano calls it. And they are pieces of software uh, that conform special purpose intelligence. They are just tools in progress. Uh, that uh, they do a, a given task or a certain limited set of tasks. We all know examples such as the so-called LLM or large language model like chat GTP, GPT, sorry. And, um, and I think that they have a great positive potential in the researchery. Particularly, I think that in the future, uh, the artificial intelligence will kind of or have the potential to liberate humans from every task that is not creative. So it's usually a task that we don't like to do. And then you have artificial general intelligence or the hard uh, definition of AI. They are full, the full artificial rendering of human-like intelligence, and they don't exist yet. And I think that it is not an incremental evolution of the artificial intelligence that we already uh, see and work with. And that um, makes sense to conjecture that artificial general intelligence, to build that, we will need first to answer that proverbial answer of how minds occur in brain. So this is one thing. And the other thing I wanna um, make a point is about the, what are predictions and what is uh, prophecy? Because uh, we are floated of prediction, prophecies, and also sometimes futurology. So predictions are specific, restricted, restricted and risky assertions about the future. They work in certain experimental settings. For example, they are using science to, take, to test hypotheses. Prophecy or futurology is another thing, but they are also called predictions sometimes. So it is confusing. They have a value. They are interesting, useful, and also they are fun, but they are not the same. The kind of, this kind of uh, long-term predictions, which are non-restricted and not specific, are far less reliable and tend to be and tend to offer a pessimistic view of the future. Most importantly, they can impact in the present, so they are important, and they they might be used to slow down innovation. As the British author Matt Riley puts it, futurology always end up telling more about your own time than about the future. The truth is, I think that the future is a novel. And the reason why the future is a novel is because we cannot predict the growth of knowledge. So, this is for introduction, and now allow me to present our first speaker, um, Mario Ganao. I think the, we, many of us know him very well. Mario is a business researcher, and is also a scientist with a wide breadth of knowledge regarding the application of innovation in the clinical practice. Besides his uh, PhD studies in nanotechnology and biomedical engineer, he is uh, deep in his understanding of business and environment 
in an environment taught in coursing entrepreneurship, global leadership, and organizational strategy at the prestigious London School of Economic in the UK. And also at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in Switzerland. Mario has also uh, been a global clinical researcher in uh, Harvard Medical School and also a visiting, res visiting researcher at the Kennedy Institute for Ethics in Georgetown University, Washington, DC. Mario's clinical and academic practice in based currently at Oxford University Hospital. He has been recently promoted to the role of clinical lead for neurosurgeon for the Southeast region by the NHS England and remain very active in various scientific society as uh, the ENS, which is our family and the Eurospine, Eurospine and the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society. Mario, sorry for this long introduction. Very long. And- uh, Happy for me is... sharing my screen. Yes. Perfect. Um, okay. Are we ready? Can you see me? We are. We are. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So, so first, uh, I would like to start with this poll. Uh, which basically ask the attendees whether exponential technology should be regulated or not. And you have four, four possible answers, yes. The second could be, we should uh, uh, regulate the development or we shall regulate the applications or we should not regulate at all. So I would be interested in knowing uh, what the attendees think and then we can discuss later on uh, during the uh, Q&A session, okay? And everybody can vote. I'm not sure that this is working. Yes, it is working. People are working? voting. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, I may have cast more than one boat. <laughs> That's very good in time of elections, uh, Nico. Yeah. You know, if the result is very biased to the no, it was me, okay? <laughs> So are we happy for me to start the talk now? Do we have enough votes? Do we have Nikos? Good, can we proceed? Yes, go ahead, Mario, go ahead. Oh. So it seems we have a clear answer. Um, Interesting. So uh, first of all, I don't have a conflict of interest to disclose for this talk. Uh, Nico has presented me very well. Uh, I'm a, a practicing neurosurgeon and consultant in Oxford University Hospital. Uh, I deal mostly with neurotrauma and, and complex spine surgery. I have governance roles uh, within, uh, within my hospital trust, uh, but also within the region. I'm the clinical lead for neurosurgery in Southeast region of England. And I have uh, uh, obviously uh, academic roles uh, here in, in University of Oxford and in scientific societies. Particularly, I'm part of the ethical legal committee of the EANS. Uh, my interest in ethics started uh, during my first PhD in nanotechnology. Uh, this is a sketch that my wife uh, 
prepared uh, for me when I was uh, studying. And basically, uh, you can see basically on the background in the window, the two towers of my university hospital and the uh, synchrotron, the particle accelerator in uh, Trieste, where I was doing my PhD. So I was dividing myself between uh, surgical practice and uh, lab. And uh, the, the most relevant uh, uh, output from my PhD in nanotechnology was this uh, paper. We were the first team to develop a single uh, uh, cell proteomic analysis for gliomas. Uh, my my uh, supervisor, Loredana Casalis, is still professor at the University of Trieste and uh, uh, my other supervisor, Jacinto Scoles, uh, uh, from uh, Princeton University. And this research uh, granted me the ENS uh, Escula Research Prize in 2015. Um, and nano, nanotechnology, nanomedicine share many commonalities with other exponential technologies. Uh, the, the main aspect is that, uh, as uh, you have correctly said, it's very difficult to predict which kind of uh, uh, development they might have because they, their, their, their rapid growth uh, make it very difficult to have uh, estimation and, and we risk to fall in the, in the area of futurology. So after the, my time in, in, in Trieste, and you can see again a, a very nice uh, uh, aerial view from, of the synchrotron, it's the only uh, particle accelerator in, in Italy or in Southern Europe other than CERN in Switzerland. And I moved to, to the Kennedy Institute of Ethics uh, as a visiting researcher. And uh, uh, there I was working on this book, Commercializing Nanomedicine, Industrial Application Patents and Ethics. Three bodies of this uh, uh, book uh, really focus on the various uh, aspects of uh, nanomedicine and nanotechnology at large, how uh, we protect uh, uh, innovation and uh, the ethical aspects of uh, uh, adopting uh, those kind of innovation in, uh, in, in the real world. And, uh, and, and obviously when we discuss uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, exponential technologies, we always have the fear of uh, a dystopian future. Uh, for instance, in terms of engineering nanomaterials, we always think about their nanotoxicity. This is a, a recent book chapter that we published this spring with my team. Um, and, and the main aspect is uh, what would happen if uh, those uh, nanomaterials could uh, affect uh, our DNA and, and, and eventually affect uh, uh, the, our future generations. But as uh, we put it in, in one of our previous work, uh, uh, nanomedicine can be seen as a bullet train. And in this analogy, only those that are already on board may really drive the train forward. Everybody else is on the platform. They can only discuss and debate pros and cons deciding whether to jump on board or not. In the meantime, they might lose the window of opportunity. Uh, a similar view can be shared also for the adoption of uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, in, uh, in, in other uh, aspects of our life, uh, and particularly because we are surgeon here in neurosurgery. Uh, so yes, the, the, the classification of uh, uh, artificial intelligence pretty much reflect what you have explained, Nico. Uh, uh, I usually define it as a narrow general and super intelligence, and at the moment we are still on narrow and we only have some examples of general AI. And we have multiple application of uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in uh, neurosurgery, particularly as a prediction tool. Um, so it is important when we deal with this kind of exponential technology to apply tools and frameworks for ethical thinking. Uh, in order to understand whether their diffusion and their adoption uh, uh, is following, uh, you know, the, the correct path and, and trying to avoid that one day we will find uh, those technologies against us as a human species. Uh, so I will start with three questions uh, uh, that I would suggest all our attendees to keep in mind uh, whenever they uh, have to deal with ethical decision making, and I will specifically frame them around the topic of innovation technology. First question is always to ask ourselves whether we possess or not all the information needed to take a decision. And uh, obviously this might be a very tricky answer. At times we only have asymmetrical information or we lack uh, you know, a, a, 
uh, the wealth of information needed for uh, for a, a, a rational decision, and we might. Uh, risk uh, uh, as uh, as uh, men and women to be moved by uh, our uh, our natural wisdom, uh, as opposed to uh, base our decision on real fact. And the problem of exponential technology is that uh, they multiply uh, uh, they multiply over time uh, whatever we input them with, and so if we if our input is a lot of natural wisdom, they will provide us with super intelligence, but if we provide them with a natural stupidity, then obviously the super intelligence will also be affected by whichever data we, we feed them with. And studying, uh, and again, is only the first part, uh, but then we always to, all we have to deal with real life. And this makes things much more difficult. Uh, because uh, values and ethical principles might be different for different person. So we need to understand what would be in the best interest of uh, as many stakeholders as possible. Uh, to do so, basically, we know that when we deal with uh, biomedical research, uh, we follow the principles stated by Beauchamp and Childress, respect for autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice which doesn't only mean that we need to respect the autonomy of every individual and try to do good and, and not harm uh, anyone and try to be as just as possible in whatever we do, but also means that we need to uh, uh, bear in mind that there are multiple other values uh, uh, that uh, um, every individual consider important for, for himself or herself. Uh, so who are the stakeholders? This is a key question and how they can be affected by our decision. And this leads to the a theory of consequentialism. Uh, it's a theory of normative ethics uh, where we might consider that the moral value of an action really depends on its consequences. But again, the consequences might affect different people in different ways. So there might be pros and cons uh, of, uh, of this theory, which has been heavily criticized uh, because effectively it's difficult to find a universal good. Uh, so one uh, framework that I would suggest uh, comes from uh, this wonderful book, The Power of Ethics from uh, Susan Liotud, uh, and is the two by four matrix. Uh, uh, is also called ethics on the fly. And, and the reason for this ethics on the fly is that similar to what we do in our a and &E, and we take a rapid decision on, on patient at times of triaging, we decide whether someone requires immediate uh, treatment uh, or can be delayed at a later stage. Uh, this type of framework can be applied to any decision making uh, related to uh, ethical issues, uh, also in the field of uh, um, uh, biomedical research. So the, 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 these two by four metrics suggest that we should use uh, two important principles, the one that we value most for the decision we are to take, uh, the most irreparable consequences that this decision can lead, uh, the driving forces that are leading this decision and the possible alternatives. So for instance, uh, we could consider uh, as important principle, respect, courage, responsibility, dependability, et cetera. And depending on the type of uh, uh, question that we have before us, we might consider different scenarios. So if we are to use, uh, if we are to uh, um, consider nanomedicine, obviously irreversible consequences of uh, uh, nanomaterials might be that they can induce uh, toxicity on us or uh, they can uh, affect the external environment. If we are considering AI, obviously the most irreparable consequence of super intelligence might be that uh, it will be a, a, um, a, a terminal event for our species. And depending on the driving forces, they might be safety, privacy, accuracy, financial gain, again, depending on the scenario that we are considering. The two alternatives are always, uh, should we regulate or should we not regulate? And, and how tight this regulation should be. Uh, and this is the reason for the poll that I had launched before this talk. Um, in terms of uh, regulatory bodies, obviously, I'm giving here two examples, nanomedicine, engineering, nanomaterials, uh, 
in, uh, in our book, we stated that they require a tight regulation. This might be different in different countries. In the European Union, we have the Observatory for Nanomaterials, uh, and it ensures adherence to uh, REACH and CLP protocols. So registration, evaluation, authorization, restriction, classification, labeling of materials. In the US, the Food and Drug Administration decided that uh, nanomaterials should be regulated under existing statutory authorities. And because they are often considered as uh, chemicals, uh, they fall under the Toxic Substances, Substances Control Act. Um, if we move to the area of robots or artificial intelligence, well, I would uh, refer to the principle of robotics issued in 2011 by the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. This council declared that humans are ultimately the responsible agents for their manufactured artifacts. And this also in, uh, means that the humans are responsible for whichever robot and artificial intelligence they develop. So to close this talk and, and give some space to my former professor, uh, James Giordano, uh, I will, um, I will uh, basically uh, conclude with this take home message. This is uh, from a commentary that I published on the Washington Post uh, while I was uh, uh, at Kennedy Institute of Ethics. And, uh, and the, the punchline is, I don't know whether robots will overtake my clinical expertise, but I'm certainly looking forward for technology to reduce the number of errors and having a positive impact on any patient outcomes. So with this, I close and I thank you for your attention. Uh, I will give some more space to, to James. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Mario. Well, uh, we are gonna go directly to the next speaker and then we'll have the question and answer at the end. Dr. Shane Giordano is a Peregrino Center Professor of Neurology and Biochemistry, is a Chief of Neuroethics uh, Studies Program and Co-Director of the Program in Brain Science and Global Law and Policy at Georgetown University Medical Center, Washington, D.C. As well, he serves as a Senior Bioethicist of the Defense Medical Ethics Center and uh, the Chakshun uh, Foundation Action Professor of Psychiatry at the Uninformed Service University of Health Services, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, USA. And is chair emeritus of the neuroethics uh, project of the IEEE -E -E Brain Initiative. Professor Giordano, is the author of over 350 publications, nine books, and 50 governmental reports. And is an elected member of the European Academy of Science and Arts, and an overseas fellow of the Rochelle Society of Medicine. Thank you again, uh, Professor Giordano, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you also for my colleague, Mario Ganao, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. You know, I, I had to chuckle. Um, the, it's the Uniformed <laughs> Services University of Health Sciences, although I do like the idea of the Uninformed University of Health Sciences, because I think so much of what we do is rather uninformed because of the gross impact on its systemic versus its idiopathic effect. I mean, if we think about much of what we do in clinical medicine, the focus is on the individual, the patient's best interest, this patient at this time. The old Latin mantra, rectoratio speculbilium, rectoratio agibilium, that the right measure of speculation for the right measure of action characteristically focuses on the clinical encounter. But as, as Professor Ganau well noted, and, and as you did as well, sir, very often we fall weakened by the larger impact systemically, systemically on a variety of levels that range from the local to the global, from the cellular all the way to the systemic and literally from the mechanistic to the moral. When we're talking about the types of developments that one can yield, clearly then the issue becomes, what do we do with the capabilities and information we have? What do we do about the information and capabilities we lack? And in that perspective, I think it becomes important to recognize that the fields of brain science that so well inform the practices of neurosurgery, both in terms of its research advancements 
and its clinical innovations and capabilities are force multipliers. And at this particular point in time, the two that are most relevant are big data and artificial intelligence. Because big data and machine learning that builds into both soft and hard AI are highly influential to create that fusion of scales that allow us to go from the infinitesimally small, as Professor Gnau well illustrated on the nanoscale of dimensionality, that we do have the capabilities to work with in our hands at present, case in point, for example, being the N cubed program of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency here in the United States, working in conjunction with a number of our international colleagues, N cubed standing for next generation non-invasive neuromodulation, where that middle end, the non-invasiveness, is contingently dependent upon the use of nano-engineered materials to introduce into the brain parenchyma a vast array of transmitting and, centri and sensing electrodes that allow real-time access to read from the living brain and write into the living brain. And if we consider the functions of the living brain to colloquially be referred to as mind, I don't care how you shape that, that represents mind reading and mind control. Each and all of these scalar opportunities are realized by data and cyber sciences and technology, as we refer to them as DCST, data and cyber science and technology. One really cannot engage data science to the level and extent capabilized by current big data abilities, tools, and methods without the necessary computational, both hard and software. And what this really reflects is the knowing doing reciprocity that exists between the tools we have and the theories that we develop. And the verifiable and falsifiable testability and perseverability of those theories as accepted truths and facts based upon the use of ever more sophisticated tools, which then brings us to what the philosopher Hans Lenk referred to as the technological imperative. In other words, the tasks lie before us. We feel it imperative to develop the tools. And once we develop the tools, we then feel it is imperative to entertain and engage the tasks. Well, if we look at artificial intelligence and we look at the tools to theory to tools and tools to task reciprocity, what we see is that artificial intelligence may be considered as a relatively iterative hierarchy that these distinct domains are not at all distinct, but relatively are indeed continua, going from relative deep learning to forms of machine learning in practice to soft and then hard AI whereby artificial intelligence then encompasses, if you will, all aspects of machine learning and deep learning in a way that is bi-directional complementary. So much of this we utilize in the brain sciences because these advances in data and cyber science and technology allow increased accuracy, diversity, scalability, speed, volume, and workability as used in practice, which in many ways reinforces and is so apropos of Mario Ganao's take-home statement as he wrote so adroitly in the Washington Post. Not quite sure if, fill in the blank, science and technology will take over my practice, but it certainly will augment, optimize, shape, and influence my practice. But here we have to ask the question, shape and optimize in what ways? This is really where we get into these issues of what those viable goods mean. Dr. Ganao's presentation about ethics is predicated upon an understanding of what ethics is. And a simple definition of ethics is that ethics represents a systematic approach to and justificatory basis for moral decision-making and actions, where morality represents how a group of individuals collectively or discollectively decide what is good or bad, right or wrong, acceptable, not acceptable, functional, non-functional, normative or pathological. To do that essentially has to integrate that within the context as well as the constructs of the fabric of the information that is used. And if we're looking at the way AI engages big data in those ways that allows utility in the brain sciences, we have to go from the cellular all the way to the systemic. 
and in so doing understand the molecular all the way to the mass effect. In other words, it's not just a question of understanding what occurs in a neuron or a glial cell, but how do those neurons and glial cell interact within their nodes that shift to form clicks within the various networks of a brain that is embodied in an organism that has been embedded and engaged in its environment? And what do we then as the interveners of those functions and factions do with that information that we've assessed, that we can now access, and we may now develop the tools to affect not only to correct pathologies that occur due to congenital malformations, injury, and disease, but also perhaps to correct particular trajectories of neurological development in ways we feel speak to the Aristotelian norm of eudaimonia, flourishing. And if we think of neurosurgical preventative medicine, working proverbially left of bang, there is a thin line, a, a literal gray zone between what constitutes preventive care, health promotions, enablement, and optimization across a range of scales and levels, literally from the subcellular all the way to the social. But what this requires is validity and reliability that underscores the value in use, large volume data banks, scales of populational data tiers, integrated potential longitudinal input requirements across lifespans and across cultures, across populations, real-time accessibility, and to make this specific for patients, de-anonymization. In other words, these are not just anonymized data. These data must be pulled into the reality of individuals so as to be able to enact high precision and specificity in what we're calling personalized medicine. Well, there is no personalized medicine without the ability to personalize, to grind that back to the reality of that individual, which then requires both acquisition and tracking across domains, from the cellular to the social, across levels, individuals, cohorts, groups, entire populations, locally, regionally, globally. That geographic locale provides us with not only the ability to assess this information, but the need to access and affect it across time spans, literally taking information from birth to grave so as to be able to create comparative and normative indices that allow us to utilize these in biomedical ways, both comparatively and normatively. What is a norm? What is a standard? What represents function or dysfunction? And what goes along with that in the way we treat that biomedically? Well, clearly, one way that we can engage this is through the use of machine learning to be able to parse these data into usable units and constructs that are viable for human enterprise. Again, to reiterate very, very briefly, there are two basic themes of AI, soft AI, in other words, that make computers more sophisticated, and relatively and iteratively more harder AI to make computers do what humans do or have done. And as uh, Professor Samson has illustrated earlier, at this point, the idea is, well, let's make those machines do those things that we don't want to. But then the question becomes, what things do we not want to do? And uh, when does that line come between the things that we want to do and the things that we feel we should do and perhaps maybe can no longer do because of, if you will, the momentum of machine learning and machine capability? and the positionality of humans with ever those loops may be. Again, to reiterate, I think the reality of this circumstance is grounded to the necessities of neuroscience and its uses in medicine. I mean, realistically, we know that emerging neuroscience and technology is capabilized, sustained, optimized by data and cyber science and technology. Look, I've been a brain scientist 42 years this year, and I can tell you that so much of not only what I learned when I was a fledgling student some four decades ago, that information that I have used in my research and its translation into clinical lifestyle and global practices has changed and has become, in fact, increased as a consequence of the amount of data that we are able to utilize, process, and synthesize into formative patterns of viable activity and engagement. Data and computational sciences have done this. They have allowed the neurosciences to be what the neurosciences indeed are. And if we then focus this more closely through the granularity of the lens of neurosurgical applications, we can see that these can basically parse into two 
non-distinct domains. These are interactive domains. Pre- and perioperative assessments, such as precision mapping and modeling, structural and functional correlation to be able to determine where in brain these mind functions occur, not just generally, not just utilizing, if you will, some set of Tellerac coordinates that we may think, well, this is where we need to put the scalpel, the borehole, the electrode, but actually mapping in that particular individual those functions that occur along those nodes and networks so as to be able to create a viable roadmap and then utilizing those roadmaps for inter-individual comparison and group to individual comparison. So as to be able to create, if you will, relative populational atlases that can be available to the neurosurgeon to more strictly and prudently guide their hands so as to affect the good for this patient with this condition under these surgical parameters. And as we put that to work, we then see the use of data and computationally science guided technologies, facilitated techniques, so much of what we're doing, for example, in deep brain stimulation, both utilizing indwelling electrodes and utilizing indwelling systems are in fact facilitated, optimized and sustained through data and computational sciences. And this also allows increased prognostication with regard to comparisons of individuals to groups and groups to individuals. And when we then do this type of comparison, we can also create normativities. In other words, what represents normality when we are considering constructs that have social, ethical, and legal relevance, such as neurodiversity, not just of functions, but neurodiversity of structures and the token functions they subserve. But certainly when we consider these relative goods, we must understand that the goods and deeds are relative. Uh, to paraphrase the moral philosopher, Alistair McIntyre at the University of Notre Dame here in the United States, what good? Whose rationale? What justice? And here too, we can parse these into two interactive domains, those ethical legal issues and risks that are focal to the technologies themselves, the intersecting unknowns between machine learning, big data, the information we have, and what that essentially means to the hard question of the brain sciences. Once again, I must tell you that if someone were to sit me down right now and put a gun in my, house, my mouth and threaten to pull the trigger unless I could tell them exactly how mind occurs in brain, they have to blow my brains out because it's not just that I, as a practicing neuroscientist and neurologist, are stupid. It's that we don't know. Realistically, this harkens back to the question that Jerry Edelman posed, paraphrasing the work of Emily Dickinson, that the brain seems to us wider than the sky with regard to its functionality of mind. And at the same time, so do the data that are necessary to gain some understanding, at least of token relationships to the brain and mind. So you have two domains that are essentially wider than the sky, which then becomes the three-body problem of physics and philosophy when we add artificial intelligence into the mix to make sense of those data about a substrate that is not only the subject of our reality as humans, but the object of our assessment and intervention as scientists and clinicians. This is where we confront the capabilities and limitations of each and all of the science's technological amendments that we're trying to utilize in terms of their viability, their validity of use, and also the possibility that these things may run away from us, become out of our control, or may open doors to vistas that heretofore were unknown to us, what is characteristically referred to as a Wechselblatt effect. In other words, nature has a peculiar sense of humor, and we don't know what we don't know and may not know what to do with it once we encounter it. On the social side, certainly we're dealing with issues of autonomy. In other words, as we're beginning to use more of these interventional assessments and engagements to be able to affect and assess the brain, are we in some way decrementing the autonomy of the person or are we enthusing it? Are we giving them more autonomous capabilities in terms of their free choice to be able to define who they are and what they are? Or are in some cases, are we wedding that autonomy to the relative restrictions or capabilities and breadth of the machine systems. Who gets the goodies? Who doesn't? How informed can consent actually be? And what are we going to use these things for? I mean, realistically, we understand that, as I said, the low-hanging fruit is the relative benevolence 
of relieving the burden of the human predicament of neurological injury, insult, disease, and decrepitude. But should we not necessarily work left of bang preventatively? Does that not constitute optimization, if not enhancement? And if we can enhance, can we not decrement? And if we can decrement, who will be decremented and who will be enhanced? But even more than that, not necessarily in a capricious, nefarious, or bellicose way, who is going to get the good stuff? And what happens to those who don't? So once again, it comes back to these core issues. What do we do with the information and capability? What do we do about it? What can be done? How do we decide what should be done? And can we do what we should? When we're talking about artificial intelligence in this context, there are a number of caveats. The main one is, where are humans in the process? And there are differing constructs and values with regard to system integrity and human involvement. Much of this comes from longstanding community historicities, philosophies, norms, and values, and end game propositions. In other words, what do we want the AI to do? And in what ways does the AI best serve the human user, share, and stakeholder? Understand, if you will, that although we, in what has been formally referred to as the West, are most comfortable with humans in the loop, it also represents a very anthropocentric position that in some ways does nothing more than reinforce our builders' biases into the machine system, which basically, at least tacitly, drives ever deeper and grounds to the function of these systems are ingrained biases, stigmatizations, and or relative views of good, bad, right, or wrong. If in fact, we're going to take, for example, Lyotard's two by four method, is that a human construct or could the AI system do better than that? One of the problems we've seen with the two by four method is that by its very nature, it is prima facie relatively preferential. And this preferentialism that it, it, it executes, that's preferentiality tends to reflect the builder's bias or the reader's orientation. In other words, it, it tends to orient to my good versus your good. And when it encounters both goods, how is it going to resolve what goods take primacy? And as well, if it's only working from selecting two primary principles, looking at two benevolent ends and two potentially maleficent ends, how do we then develop the balanced justice necessary to execute that two by four ethics on the fly? We've suggested that what may be necessary is a larger risk analysis and mitigation process that engages a broader supplemental ethics, if you will, a supplemental ethics that can be used simo sumpta. In other words, not just prima facie, where everything seems great at face value, but these ethical principles must be used together so as to facilitate the viability of that AI system engaging its role in such a way that is going to preserve identifiable goods across all share and stakeholders involved in the calculus of application. Certainly humans could remain on the loop, but please be aware that there are particular orientations, most notably those of our trans-Pacific colleagues, that are very, very influential and enthusiastic about human being out of the loop, which then preserves the integrity of the AI system without human biasing and without stigmatization. But a simple discussion of the way data and I can be used in medicine brings to the fore in stark relief the issues, tensions, and conflicts that are the grounds of these dilemma. On one hand, what we're looking to do is gain prevention, prevention against various harms, prevention against the predicaments of, of, of destructions of our flourishing and our survivability, but to do so, we have to probe ever deeper into the essence of individual data and make those data accessible across a range of various engagements, situations, and enterprises, which thereby becomes potential conflicts of privacy. We're seeking to be protected from those things that harm us so as to execute the benevolence of medicine, yet to do so requires incredible amounts of data from each and every individual. And we then have to ask, who will be the provenance and custodian of these data? And what does that then mean for personal liberties and rights, particularly on the global stage? 
And obviously, if we're also utilizing these means to create comparative and normative indices that are relevant to public health across a Gaussian distribution of neurodiverse realities, what happens to where we need to draw certain thresholds and guidelines with regard to our regard and treatment, inclusive of those who may or may not get these neurologically capabilized goods? We also need to be very, very cognizant of the fact that it is not just the proverbial West that is so engaged in the development of the science and technology. Realistically, at this particular point, we understand that much of what is occurring in the data science and computational science, as well as the biomedical science and technological forefront is occurring in the East, in Asian countries, with China leading the way both by intent and by design. And along with that comes a very distinct cultural history, cultural philosophy, set of ethics and set of practices that in some ways may comport with those of the West, but in others may not, which may lead to certain at least dissonances, if not advantages, which then can shape the valence trajectories and codes and conducts of what is being researched and then translated. So to engage this process ethically, we've called for a, an ethics that is more cosmopolitanly cognizant, yet capable both within and between communities. It needs to accommodate pluralist needs, values, norms, and mores, and must be sensitive and cognizant as well as responsive to being affected by and affecting economics on both macro and micro scales, politics, and the power balances that come from having this level of information and being able to do things with it. Ladies and gentlemen, Knowledge is power, and the tools that rend such knowledge and render it at hand create power dynamics, and with power comes great responsibility. And part of that responsibility is not just discussion, but dialectic towards development of a globally relevant design towards the guidance and governance, oversight, and use of big data and cyber and computational sciences and biomedicine that appreciates cultural diversity acknowledges local needs and values, but also particulates and are, uh, anticipates the particularities, difficulties, and opportunities of collective efforts. We've proposed the following considerations, beginning any ethical discourse with six questions. What sciences and technologies are available for current use? Why is it being advocated? Who will receive it? When? What part of the algorithm and how will that be used? Where will it be engaged? What locale? What nation? What domain? And what mechanisms will be in place for the ongoing provision of services and re resources, not only to maintain and sustain the use of that science and technology in practice, but to confront and correct not if things go wrong, but when things go wrong, because the more diverse and the more extensive the use of a science and technology within and between populations, the greater the risk for error because of fractal diffusion. Those questions must be framed by 60 considerations. What are the real capacities and limitations of the science and tech, not only alone, but in combination? What are the consequences incurred by the use or non-use of the science and tech in the short, intermediate, and long term? And as you heard earlier from our two prior speakers, such long-term prediction and speculation is very, very difficult to model as a consequence of moving beyond the vista of probability and possibility into that longer term vista of potentiality. What are the contexts of needs and value that influence the use or non-use of science and technology? What is the nature of the continuity of research and revision? And ultimately, given these variables or the lack of their knowledge, how informed can consent really be? And what goes along with that consent in both individual as well as systemic domains? If we're calling for change, oh, we've said that these change require the three or four Ps. Persons who are participants in the change process, participatory alignment to understand what the aims, goals, and potential end dimensions may be, and purposivity, identifying goals, identifying outcomes, and identifying the necessary administrative infra and extra structures that are required to be able to affect and sustain those changes. Putting this into practice requires an additional set of Ps. Pragmatism, realism in its analysis of not only what happens now, but how current activities may purport near-term future capabilities and change through the use of data-based modeling. To be prepared 
for those things that can go right and can go wrong. And to do so requires interdisciplinarity of personnel who are perceptive, who are relatively pessimistic, who are able to understand through skepsis what could go wrong and what couldn't, but who are persistent in recognizing that things that go wrong are not just challenges, but are opportunities for positive change. And through those opportunities, developing predictions through probabilities and potentialities and identifying those problems that are containable, retrievable, reversible, or even perhaps forgivable because the problems incurred create broader vistas for opportunities of problem resolution, whereby the proverbial juice is worth the squeeze. Prudence is required in each and all of these, true prudence, Aristotelian prudence, practical wisdom, so to speak, and that practical wisdom must inform policy. Please understand, we're not saying here that preparedness represents some prevention of the relative promise the positive outcomes that these scientific and technological innovations may yield. Just the opposite. Preparedness is, in fact, being open-minded to the possibility of both positivity and problematics. It requires a stance that's focused, flexible, fast-moving, and adapting to the realities that the science and technology evokes, not doing it necessarily a priori in those ways that are performative, Understanding, if you will, the Colling Ridge dilemma that very often you will not know what problems and challenges arise until you go there. But to do that, you must remain aware and flexible. Aware and flexible to both idios and idiosyncratic and systemic benefits, burdens, risks, threats, and harms. We've advocated what we call the SMART approach, security management, administration, research, and training. And in so doing, we've advocated a six-step process. If indeed we're going to use big data together with artificial intelligence in ways that are biomedically relevant to the neural sciences, particularly, there is the need for what we call medical information non-discrimination acts now that are neurologically operationalized and workable, NOW. This advocates a stance originally proposed by Stephanie Kostiuk in 2012. The need for programmatic cybersecurity by design, whereby these systems of information acquisition and use are made biosecure in those ways that minimize the relative risk and increase their benefit. Ongoing surveillance of the field, which then requires a relative openness and transparency with, with some measure of capability for ongoing surveillance and the need for discourse, not just in discussion, but in dialectic to be able to reconcile what may be apparent distinctions and dissonance to come together in other and more consonant system. That requires education and training, iterative education and training, not only of our biomedical professionals, but of our cyber and data professionals, of those individuals working in the social and anthropological sciences into which these systems will be fit in the large scale and also within the law. And obviously, as with any philosophical approach that's oriented to the sciences, these approaches interdisciplinarily must remain self-critical and self-revising. Because fixity of purpose in maintaining the relative good requires flexibility of method. Going forward, what does this require? Well, it requires cashing the reality check. It's not a question of Terminator scenarios or of HAL supercomputers. Are these things possible? There are potential futures, but we still have our hands in the toolkit. What it really requires is realistic insight and savvy to both the technology, literally the tools and the way we use it, and the balance of relative goods, resources, and services that are demanded that those technologies and those tools may in fact enable with regard to share and stakeholders. It requires security by design, designing into the system, both idiosyncratically and systemically, those things are gonna relatively create security as the system develops and a globally relevant and responsive ethics. We have to cash the reality check because the take home message is that with this increased capability of knowledge, tools, engagement, comes increased power. And power can be multivalent. And with increased capability and increased power comes increased responsibility. Reflection, insight, Prudence, they must be the stepping stones for each and all of our acts of inquiry, invention, and innovation, not simply to stand in place or to go backwards in some narrow form of, if you will, preventative or, or careful principle. It's not just a question of a precautionary principle writ narrow. 
but rather a precautionary principle that is keen on footfall effects. Taking those steps forward, but doing so in a balanced way, so as to remain well afoot and balanced in across all axes of orientation, irrespective of shifts in the architectonics of the terrain that both we may create and we may disrupt. An end thought for each and all of us is as we go forward, it becomes important for us to measure twice before we make the cuts of inclusion or exclusion, because far too often when it comes to technologies this disruptive, these rapidly paced, there's often no turning back. If you're interested in some of our ongoing work that has addressed these topics over the past decade or so, I provide that bibliography here. And of course, we will have some time for Q&A, but if you want to get in touch with me after this particular webinar, you can reach me here. You can reach me at james.giordano at georgetown.edu. And with that, I'll conclude and thank to each and all of you, both for your time and your interest in our work, and a special thanks to the developers of the webinar and my buddy Mario Ganao for inviting me. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we run out of time for question, but I invite you all to, to join the discussion of these very important topics online. And um, I see you very soon, hopefully in person and have a nice afternoon. Thank you all for joining. Bye.